uh, this, that's it. So this is now we're slowly, slowly moving into bioinformatics, and today we will talk a bit about what is called biological databases. So it's partly it's a little bit of computer science. What is a database, which is not, no, but nothing in deep depth. But partly it's also a bit of going through what type of data that exists. Some of the most important databases. So there's nothing that Databases, well, if some databases you should know what they are because you use them all the time. But of course, there are thousands of databases out there, thousands of different types of data, and nobody can keep track of everything. And there's a tendency that, unfortunately, that a lot of people uh, make databases that are the way they pay, but when they're not maintained. So these, um, these databases are. Um, I mean, you, you basically, in the science community, we live on papers. We, so we write a paper about a database, but then it's very hard to get funding to keep it up to date. You need to update it and do that. So that, that that's very, because you need someone needs to do it. And uh, so unfortunately, a lot of databases that are old and outdated. So, are, so most of the good databases are maintained by the big centers that are doing that, that are doing it. Well, okay, what is a database and what, what types, how do you deal with them? Uh, so, there are different structures of databases. It can be just a flat file, basically, if you call it a database. There are what's called relational databases and other types also. And, um, if, and of course, then you somehow you have to interact with them. You can maybe use some kind of advanced machine here. Uh, so, of course, a simple database is a phone book. I, mean, I, don't, I guess you, you're too young, you don't remember, but in the old days, there was phone books. They had phone numbers and names. I think I haven't seen one for 10 years or something like that, but they were, every year you got a new one delivered to your home. It was kind of interesting. So, it was a piece of a database. It was in paper form, but of course, it was a database. And of course, the phone book had a name, so s.klaus, phone number, and an address, North Pole Lapland. Interesting place. And some M mouse that was living in Disney World. And a moon man was living in Craterland. So there are any phone number. So you, and of course, these were normally in alphabetic order. So if you want to look for a name, it was not so hard to find people. If you want to look for a phone number uh, and ask what the name was, it was a pain. Because basically they were not sorted, so you had to read through the whole phone book to find it. And that's slightly easier with the computer, they are quite good at doing these stupid things. But the kind of fast fly format is very much used still in bioinformatics. It's kind of the basic, because it has old traditions, and it actually is, has, in some ways, some advantages. The advantage is that it actually is computer readable. Or, or, or man readable also. So I can actually understand what it's just there. I can look at it and read it. Then, of course, I cannot read through everything, but I, I can see an entry and I can look at it. So, this is a gene bank. So yesterday, we had I tried to write this Python program and I actually downloaded a gene bank file. So, this is part of it that it looks like. So, it has information about something about the, the, the type of gene, this is a DNA sequence, how long it is, some locus of information, which is uh, a definition here. So it has a keyword here, which is kind of a something, and then some data. It has also some accession numbers. So There's a number that's unique for every entry, which makes it very important because then you can link to other databases using these numbers. So you have this database has that one, this one goes there. And make up a different versions, because of course you can have your sequencing of a gene, and you realize there's something wrong with it, and you want to need to change that to update it. You don't, don't want to make a new entry and have to keep the old one, because, but you still want to know keep the information of the old one. And there are some keywords, for instance, that someone put in there. There's a source, so for the gene, it's important what organism does it come from. And here is something to think about. It's like, okay, if I someone, someone writes Saccharomyces cerevisiae, someone writes Baker's yeast, someone writes yeast, just. So you need somehow, if you want to use, be useful, you need to define what type of words you can put here, for instance. And in keywords, even more. And here, here you have the organism. Even more defined in like polygenetic concepts. It's, it's, it's Saccharomyces cerevisiae, it's a eukaryote, it's fungi, Ascomisota, Saccharomyces cotina, Saccharomyces. This really tells you what subspecies it is. 
So if you find, find something else which is also fine guy, this will be the same, but then maybe it will not be an asking me quota. So these kind of defined dictionaries of the called ontologies are very important if you make this database. So you, you, you don't want to put just free text here. So in my classical example is of course that people now are trying to do if you look at medical records. It's like how do you define, I mean, you go to the doctor and they write a journal every time you, you go there and write something. Most of that is free text. They write, I and mean, they have some of learn some things to do it, but they write the influenza, wants antibiotic, don't know the difference between bacteria and viruses, go home. Right. But they will provide some f free text. <coughs> so that is very hard for a computer to read, because it's, you can define the same things in different things. Computers are getting better at it. We had this Watson that was uh, IBM computer that could understand the questions for, to win Jeopardy. But in general, it's actually a hard problem. Unfortunately, it's hard for humans to enter things very, very, very uh, organized. If a doctor reader will say, how to click, click, click this, and they are not always, I mean, you, if you want to find all possibilities before, it's actually quite difficult to do it. You have to think about it. But it makes the computer read one much easier later. So there's always one part when, you, when this database are is that these ontologies are defined, but they are also developing. So they change in different time because people realize things that can be done better. But it's also when people deposit something, so when you put something mm -hmm. in this database, there are strict checks that are often are that are that they follow the quality, so everything is there. Because otherwise, people just skip one part here yeah, and later they want to do it. But nowadays, there are, you can't deposit it before you have fulfilled all the same criteria in most databases. But still, it's not an obvious case. You're, and uh, there the are often things missing, particularly old data and so on, so it's not obvious. But this is a flat, so, but it is a flat file database. And it, the basic force, this is not how the computer handles it inside, but it's a good way to communicate between different things. And the only problem is that it gets extremely big for big databases, and it's getting not very, you need to parse things, so it's not super efficient. And it's not very easy to search. If you want to find all Saccharomyces genes, you have to go through the whole database to look for that. So it takes, you have to search, if a computer has to look, if a computer that takes a long time. And that's where so-called relational databases are much more efficient, where we principally have different tables that have links to each other. So you have a protein code here, hemoglobin here, and then you have another link to another table that have a sequence. So then you can make a small database here and you can find everything in this database that have a sequence to then get out everything from at least the hemoglobin and get all the sequences. This is called simple query language of the SQL. So this is often a much more faster way to look at things. Particularly if you want to do, I want to find hemoglobin from bovine, you can search it extremely fast instead of having to go through a whole table of things because they are already there. It's basically your keywords to look for. Uh, so that's how the, how you store the computer in the database. But then, of course, you could take this and transform it to a flat file or, and transform it back. You just have the rules. But in behind, if you want to do searching, if you want to look things like that, and think about Google basically. I mean, Google, I mean, you, you type a keyword, and you, in two seconds, you get the answer of every web page that has this keyword in some rank. So, of course, they, they don't go through all the web pages, they don't have a big data with all the web pages, they don't go through that. They just have a list of every web page that has this word. And that's of course much faster. You find, you find the word, and you go this, and you, go, you, have, you have to jump between. So it's way much faster. And this is basically how you can do things. You have different keys. So here, here is some kind of database. You have a name and last author, institution, department, address. So you look for. Uh, for instance, Peter Lewis, and then you have a second table here of contacts. You have, and you have a contact ID here, which is number two. Which then is number two here is the key here. And that's University of Toronto, the part of that. So you don't have so basically. And then, but then you can easily go back also. So you can basically say, okay, who has contact ID two? I can look for, find it fast and find everybody at University of Toronto. Uh, so basically, and you. You can make this extremely complex. You can make things like you know, two tables here and there. You can make, yeah, smart ways, two stupid ways. It's not always easy way, way to do it in the best way, but for m many searching, it's way much faster. Particularly when the data gets big. All 
Okay, so where is the data stored often? So often the idea is, as I said, is that you have in biology somehow someone generates data. And normally it's the sequences, something like that, or some or structure, something else. And you have a program that extracts this data. And then you, you basically deposit the data in a database. So for instance, and then there are actually that, uh, <coughs> here you have this checking, so often mainly automatic checks. I mean, you don't want to submit a sequence that have a non-existing amino acid in it, that has a, has a B, or a put a sequence, or a X sequence, or if the X should mean something. So there are, there are a lot of, you, you need to make sure that the format is correct. You don't want, in fact, you want to make sure that the organism is actually an organism that, that is in the ontologies, etc., etc. So they're cleaning the and you actually have to get things back. And then there's, you somehow store there and you have a data warehouse or something you can call it with a big server somewhere. And these things are getting much more distributed nowadays because often this is basically hard to maintain. Because if you want to have data with everything, that's hard to maintain. And then there are usage. And often nowadays you have a web interface. That's what people get these things, get the data. Or you can download it, or download some part of the data. Uh, so this is just an example. Someone have a transporter database, how they set up things. So the transporter are proteins that are involved in transport. And in this case, they actually take the genomic data from some sequences, has an analysis pipeline that actually tries to find all the transporters, that are, uh, or everything that's similar to a known transporter. So they, they have some bioinformatics method here that is trying to identify transporters. And then they put it into the database here. Uh, yes, this is not very big, so you probably have just one machine, or a few machines sitting here. And they're using a program called MySQL, so that's a database uh, program. And then they have, so they have linked things from different places here. And of course, they know what, what genome you have, you know, sequences, you know, the hits here, etc. And then from the, we have, a, we have a web browser that you, people can search for the name and the family and then search functional relationships, etc. And you have some interface in between. Or in another case, you can basically have ontologies for, in this case, basically, as I said, okay, I want to have a database of multiple sequence alignments. So the sequence alignments are, we we'll talk about it on Monday, I think, or maybe Tuesday next week, so, uh, sequences that are aligned to each other. And then in this case, you, you, have a, you can define exactly how you want to submit it. You can have uh, alignment, the sequences here, you can have different columns, you can have different registers, you can add features to it. You can define how conserved they are, how much the variation is, etc. So you can, you can define it very, very strictly how, what you can put in there. So then you, if you submit a new alignment, you need to follow this information here. So you, maybe you, here you can have what type of, if you want to do it, you can probably skip some parts of it, but you can't submit something in a, uh, that doesn't follow this line, because then it will be reacted. So, what is the database? As I said, it's, it basically is um, some kind of structured collection of information. So, it, so each entry, has a, it's, a, it's a single entry, so you have a, some basic unit, this is often what you have. Like, like one gene, one protein. But then you have the structure together, and you have all these predefined data related that are as a record. So if, if you have a protein database, maybe we'll have put a name, maybe, maybe have some uh, properties like a sequence. You maybe know that some part of the protein is transmembrane, or that some other part is uh, glycosylated, something like that. And so, so you basically have this one by one. And, and, and normally in bioinformatics there are two types of databases. There are two types, two. There are basically databases where we have the raw data. So and, and in m many fields, now if you do an experiment and you want to publish the paper, you need to deposit your data in these databases. So this paper that you get to read here yesterday, and one example they had was like, the thing about the myoglobin structure. So basically, Kendra and these people got the Nobel Prize for having solving the structure of myoglobin. 
kind of also wrote a paper about it and wrote analysis on it and tried to understand it and I got double price. But really somehow the most important thing they did is actually they deposited this structure so someone else can look at it. So then they really have uh, uh, it has been downloaded millions of times probably because it might say every, every basic biochemistry class of structure biology, structure biochemistry, you look at my globin because it has lots of interesting features. I mean it has a lot of uh, uh, or, or uh, biochemically interesting things like how does the oxygen get there, how is it binding, what is happens when you when you take great oxygen, what happens on the when carbon monoxide binds, etc. etc. So a lot, lot of interesting biochemistry that that you can understand uh, looking at the structure. But so that is basically some raw data some submitted there. Uh, and it, uh, it's really very, very important for the field. So that's why most journals nowadays require, in many fields, that you ha that you deposit your data in, a f in in one public database, so that people can use it. Some people, sometimes you are sometimes you're allowed to keep it secret for six months or twelve months or that. And uh, there are. But it's it's really, really important for the field because it's so much to be used. And particularly, it's. it's um, it is uh, maybe often used to make these derivative databases. So basically, someone takes all the protein structures and makes a second database of using this information. Or, particularly, you make some analysis to try to understand all the structures together, and you take all these hundreds of sequences and do something smart with them, and you get some new understanding about the paper. But there are also these secondary databases, or maybe you integrate data from different sources. You can do the genomes and the protein structures and you integrate it. So how many protein structures can be from more genomes? So there, there are a lot of data that you get by integrating that can be done, done things there. So th this you could call derivative databases. So they are somehow derived from primary data. And these are often made by someone. So there are a lo lot of these here. They're called uh, RefSec protein. Some of these are very common, some are very, very specific, etc. But um, and in, in the general, there are formally this case is really con content belongs to the submitter. So gene bank is a typical example where people submit gene sequences, and it's only updated by submitter. So if you have done something wrong, you can update it yourself. Nobody else can fix it. Uh, and then, but then of course there are some lots of algorithms and, cu and also curators. So actually, there are for instance, in Unipod, I think there are about a hundred people that sit there, take this data and other data also in papers and uh, actually assigns, well, runs all the programs of course, but also assigns a lot of uh, uh, other information about these figures and make them, uh, what's called, in this case it's Uniprot, I go back, back to that, which is annotated information about every gene, every protein. And of course, this is the problem. Is the problem really here is like this takes time and money. I mean, as long as the algorithm that's easy, it's automatic. The problem is like that are in many cases this manual creation is quite important. It really helps things. And particularly for the up, I mean, a lot of this maybe it's not so much that you actually need to look at it in each individual case, but you update the algorithm, you, you, you test that it really works. You, you, you take errors, etc., etc. So and that's hard to get funding for, but there are. Three, a couple of centers in the world that do it. So NCBI is one center. Uh, so here, now, you know, slide has something called RefSec, which is like sets of all sequences here that is like more annotated, or unique, or genome samples, etc. So, some overview of the types of databases that exist. It's probably a bit out of date. But you see, there are a lot of different types. You have nucleotide sequences, um, expression arrays. Nowadays, that's probably more or less RNA sequences, probably proteomics data, plant data, immunological data, protein sequences, protein structures, other structure data, organelle data. A lot, lot of databases that exist. Yeah, some names of these things are. I mean, so this is another list here. You have chemical public. Uh, this is NCBIs, uh, old list of NCBI lists. So there are two big centers in the world. I'll come back to them in a second. One is NCBI in the US, the other one is EBI in England. So that's the European version. So this is some list of NCBI databases. I'll get back to more of it. And three is this, like the portal they have here. There are three domains. They have genome projects, they have uh, 
snips or every single mutation in, well, in humans and others that are then of course you're linked to diseases really sometimes cancer chromosomes nucleus a lot of derived data they do there most the most common thing that people use is probably PubMed which is not in this list so basically the uh, literature searching now Google is starting to challenge that because they have Google scholars which is actually sometimes much better but but PubMed is the, the database that has every abstract of every scientific paper published the last 50 years or 100 years almost like so it's basically and that's that's where you go to look for papers and there's European copy of that also but which I never use might be good and this is the corresponding things at EBI so just an overview of their database that is like uh, DNA RNA gene expression proteins structures systems chemical biology ontologies literature so that's PubMed or Euro European PubMed software other software etc so as I said there are two main providers so NCBI and EBI so they are there they really are hundreds or maybe even thousands um, well, at least hundreds of bioinformaticians employed there mainly to maintain this data service and they also develop new things some are doing more research some are grants etc but a lot of it is to keep on developing providing the services infrastructure for all the life science bioinformatics or all the life science so the, it's really and it, 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 it is a problem because it's hard to get funding for it it's really hard you need, need to motivate to get money for this and it's not so easy to motivate to maintain things it's always much more flashy to do something new so you also have to decide in this case what you're not going to maintain you can't maintain everything if nobody uses it you just keep you, keep, you should leave it but it, ta it takes effort to do it I mean not just computer sex takes t t uh, time to update things there's also something called GenomeNet in Japan that I don't really know how good it is, but I never, I never used it, but it's, there is a Japanese version. So some of these parts are also Japanese versions. So basically there are three parts of the world that are doing this. Europe, US, and Japan. And some parts are duplicated, some parts are just the more dominated on one side. So this is the, this is the NCBI homepage. So you can actually search all databases there, if you want this is the lab on Friday or Thursday, something like that. You can do it, it here. So you can search everything, you just type cancer and you see what happens. Uh, you might have time to look a bit this, this at the end. And uh, there are a lot of tools. <coughs> you can download the data. You can look at the YouTube channel, you can learn how to use it. So you can see a popular resource of PubMed, Bookshelf, I guess they books. PubMed Center is actually a lo li lot of online papers that are, a lot of papers that are uh, complete, not just abstract. PubMed Health, you know, that's probably more health related, not life science. BLAST is uh, probably the most used tool in bioinformatics. This is your tool for sequence searching. We'll talk about it on Monday. Nuclear genome SNPs so are sequence databases. The gene is also has protein protein database. PubChem is more chemistry and this is more molecules chemistry. And then there's a milestone here. They annotate the 150s eukaryotic genomes. So now they have 150 eukaryotic genomes. And there's a new FTP site. Okay. So there are a lot of things there. They're training tutorials, a lot, lot of data here if you, want, if you really want to do it. EBI is similar. It has a different uh, view, of course. And they have a one day course in metabolomics and bioinformatics for nutritionists in London. So there's an open meeting here. So there are lots of courses, conferences. And the marmoset genome sheds light on chimeral twins. Okay, I don't really know anything about that. Uh, so that's a news, that more popular science news, but uh, oh, popular science. And they have a new improved human genome. Uh, so they have a new version of uh, release 38 of the human genome, the annotated human genome. That is new, improved. I don't know exactly what happened, but it certainly is better than version 37. Uh, EMB, EBI, so the European Bioinformatics is a part of something called EMBL, the European Molecular Biology Laboratory, which is an organization that existed for 40 years, I guess. And it was made in Heidelberg, but then how our stage was, so this is in Hingston in Engl England. And this is the Japanese version of it that I haven't really used. The, the part database I have used here is mainly KEG, which is um, 
Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes. So there's a lot of functional maps like this, like uh, well, maybe not. How, how um, metabolic pathways work in different organisms. That, that's actually what is really good at. I'm sure it has a lot of other data also, but I have never used it. <coughs> Most of these databases are published in something called the Nuclear Acid Research Database Issue. So every year there's a um, paper on nuclear acid research, it's, it's a normal research paper, a published paper on research about nuclear acids, so a lot of genes, a lot of things for that, and a lot of uh, RNA and DNA. But they have a database issue, so basically if you, the last version of GeneBank every year more or less publish one paper there, every two years. It's actually probably quite boring to read most of these papers, and it probably, uh, but they are of course used a lot of science loss, so it's a very high impact factor. The, the other thing is that there are these big databases are used a lot, but there are a lot of other small databases that are published there, and they are never used. So doesn't mean that if you get a paper in there, it doesn't mean that much. Because uh, even because uh, and you have to pay for it also. So it's basically paid as advertisement. But uh, yeah, so that's this is probably all. Well, I mean, one of the oldest really international database consortium in biology is, is basically how do you get all the gene information in there? And uh, so th this is a typical example of things. Well, I mean, in the old days, it was not that much. Was people could almost do it manually. But now, of course, the number of genes are sequenced every day, so are billions. I mean, well, I mean, not billions, but at least millions. Uh, and so basically, there are three different databases. GeneBank, it's called EMBL, and DDBJ, which is a database, DNA, something Japan. And these databases are <coughs> they are uh, synced between each other. So basically, you only need to deposit to one of them. They are, they are distinct databases, so you, but so they have different numbers, they have different accession numbers, etc. But they are synced. So that if you deposit one database within 24 hours, it ends up with other two also. But that's like, but yeah, most people deposit close where they are. And there are quite a lot of strict controls. It's not just submit your sequence file there and see what happens. You need to have full follow the portals. So an entry in GeneBank looks like that. Most of it is quite boring. It's A C T G T C J A T A A. But as you had this part up here that we looked at before that it has information about what's we'll it I think it says Homo sapiens, something. It says some number gene the name there, it has some uh, references to other databases. Um, so this is the raw gene database. So basically every genome is there, everything there. It's, it's kind of paint if you want to maintain, what, do, use it directly, but I mean, now it's gigantic. So if you really want to use, search everything there, you you can do it, but it's not uh, perhaps the most informative. So also these derived databases are more useful to use, because they kind of at least filters it down slightly and cleans it up a bit. There used to be also quite a lot of data that was in patterns and that was secret that were there, but I think that that, that amount is decreasing, I think. So let's talk a bit about proteins. We most, most of this course we talk about proteins. So let's go through some of the protein databases a little bit, and particularly Uniprot. So sequences, protein sequences are, well, this, I don't know the one is a magma in Europe, we use Uniprot. So you unify protein database. So the universal protein resource. So that's supposed to be the gold standard comprehensive resource for protein sequence and functional annotation data. And this is functional annotation, it's keywords. So this is not just the sequences, it's actually annotated. So there is some annotation about what this sequence does. It doesn't have to be very reliable, it doesn't have to be correct, but there are if there is information there. And you can also get the information on how likely it is to be correct. Because it depends where it comes from. Most of the data, most of the proteins that are in this database, have never ever been studied by an experimentalist. Because they are from some genome project somewhere. But so the only information you get is by finding that it's homologous, that it's similar to another sequence. 
and you, then you take that annotation and you do an inferred by homology information that is most likely to do the same thing. But there are a lot of data that are, I mean, I put it in like my globin, it's extremely well studied. People, people studied, spent thousands of many years studying my globin in every single aspect you can think about it. So the myoglobin annotation is extremely accurate. You can really go into everything there. And there are everything in between these two extremes. So there are some, some, exper some data that is part of a high throughput experiment. You find something and some that are, someone actually looked on lab and done it. You have structures, you have non-structures, etc. So there are a lot of, lot of data, but it's, it should be all there. It's certainly not perfect, but it's the best thing that exists. Then you, for instance, have other databases. You have, uh, uh, well, pride is a proteomics that's been put to find by proteins, but uh, can skip that. PFAM is something we'll talk about a little bit more later. Also, it's a protein family database. So it basically takes the proteins together and they divide them into domains. We can talk about that also later, and they cluster the proteins that are similar into groups. So every protein domain that is similar should be in one PFAM family. And then you can then, uh, so this is uh, also a big consortium, or well, slightly small consortium to do it, because it's hard to make this work automatically. And the problem is if you make it complete automatically is that you, every update you do will change things. Because they're always going to be cut off. So, so PFM is kind of semi-manually. So basically it has some defined families and then you just find new members to it. And then of course if some families are well, well defined, they can change the definition. And the good thing about that is that it's actually quite stable during time. So there were other databases that did similar things, but they were not all, they didn't keep the stability during time. Uh, Interpro is basically a combination of PFAM and some other databases, but in my mind, PFAM is really the key there. Uh, these are more some tools. You have uh, PDB Europe. So PDB, PDB. So protein data bank, and there's a European version of it, but the main site is in uh, the US. Nowadays, well, in two places in the US, both at the, but um, both in New York and in uh, San Diego. So protein data bank is a database of protein structures, so microbial structures there. So every single structure that's the positive database ends up in PDB, and also nucleotide structures and so on, but mainly proteins. So, and that is mostly a raw database, but then it has also annotations about it. You know, what is the functional site? What, what is the myoglobin? What is this uh, group binding the, the uh, oxygen? What are the residues are important? There's a lot of additional data, but the most important part is just the raw structure data. And not, not the raw data from the structure, but the, the, the structure itself. The raw data, experimental data is also now that's often also deposited. Um, okay, let's go through Uniprot before break. Uh, so Uniprot is or actually Uniprot KB, so Uniprot Knowledge Base, which is like Uniprot is a is the important part. So that's basically you have. Here is the gene bank, the division of all the sequences. You have Unipark, which is a sequence archive, which is just everything like that. Is. And then you have some reference sequences, basically everything is just a process of that one. And you have 150, 90, so 100 base means that basically you take everything here, but you only take, if there are two things that are identical, you only take one copy of them. So that's why it's 100. And here, if it's Unirf 90, if there are two things that are 90% or more identical, you only keep one copy of them. So you kind of take away things that are very, very similar. And that reduces, I think you probably reduce the factor by a factor two in each of these steps more or less. But that is just the, the sequence itself, nothing else. But then you have the Uniprot KB, so there's a knowledge base. So basically that adds n information to it. And the knowledge base can be divided in two parts. One called Swiss pot, one called Tremble. So this is the for, for historical reasons. SwissProt was the sequence database, really. It was really the sequence database that was used for uh, proteins. 
and uh, uh, so the, 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 it was in Switzerland. That's why it was Swiss plot. Now it's mostly done in, in Hingston, but it's still called Swiss plot for that reason. Swiss, it's still a large part done in Switzerland by, and paid by Swiss people. And then they have Trembel, which is a translated EMBL database. So they take the EMBL, which was a gene database, and translate translated to a protein. So it's just that, that information. The difference is that Swiss plot is manually annotated and reviewed. So every gene there, someone has looked at the annotations and make sure they make sense. Has some put some manual consideration into the annotations you make. It doesn't mean that it's uh, always correct, but at least there is some manual check to it. Of course, the use of computer tools is also there. They are not doing everything just by looking at it, but they are there's a manual step in it. While Tremble, which is done much bigger, is just annotated by automatic pipelines. So basically, you run a number of programs uh, and it's not reviewed. So, uh, uh, and they have, of course, some, they have some subset here that is a complete reference and proteome set. So they have some proteomes and reference and a better annotated set and so on. And then you have some other things that are part of the things that, that, that we don't care about. So really, Uniprot is worrying up with if you want to look at the protein, you want to figure out what it does. And of course, every entry here has links to other databases or many other databases. So if there is a structure known of this protein, you have a link to PDB. So yeah, this is just to show that these databases are growing. So I thought this should be more of the same scale. So this is the this one stopped at 2010. Uh, no, this is SwissPlot. So SwissPlot was actually quite uh, picked up speed. It was, it was ten years ago, it was about 100,000 sequences, and now it's up to more than half a million. So it's quite, quite a lot of sequences there annotated. But of course, this one is just exploding. So uh, uh, five years ago, it was maybe one million or one and a half million. Now it's ten million sequences, and it's probably, well, this is 2010, so it's probably an order of 50 million or something. Today. Each entry looks something like this. You can't really see this, but um, uh, let's actually do. Uh, let's go to Uniport here. That's, that's faster. So you can look at it here. Let's uh, search for myoglobin. And you see there are seven myoglobins here. There's a globin, different species different names. This is the SwissPod names and this is enter names. So let's click on one, the first one. And then you get one entry. So you have protein names, myoglobin, gene name, organism, this is human, some identifier, this is where it comes from, this is how long it is, the, how, the status of it, how complete it is. Uh, it exists, there's evidence at protein level that it actually exists. So many cases you have never seen the protein, you have only evidence from the DNA level. Well, my globin is it belongs to some global family. And it's some functional notation what it does. It supply oxygen. You have some keywords on bio biological processes here. We get back to this so called gene ontology keywords on the other side here. And uh, so this is the idea about what it does. More about more, more this is Gene ontology is, a, is an ontology, so a, data, a dictionary of functional descriptions in biology. So it's a biological process. It responds to hypoxia. So if you don't get any, in molecular function, it binds heme. It has a heme group bound to it. It binds iron. It's an iron in the middle. It's oxygen binding, etc. As in a more information there. And you have some annotation of sequence. It's one chain. It starts with the methionine that is removed in the sequence after. Uh, Translation. It has a metal binding here in position 65 and 94. There are a number of known mutants here that are natural variants on these positions. Uh, and there are some expanded conflicts here in this position. There's a secondary structure. So there's a lot of one, two, three, four, five helices and a few short helices. And some turns here. Here's a sequence. And there's a number of references to papers where it comes from. 
and uh, here's links to other databases if you want to go to inbl you go here and find it there or inbank other databases refsex is basically the american version of this uni is a gene it's a pdb link to 3rjk what's name there there's an interaction database that has something there there is uh, some chemistry data about it there's a, some phosphorylation site information there, etc, etc. There are ensembles, the database of the human genome mainly, or eukaryotic genomes. Uh, are the specific for organism databases, phylogenomic databases, gene expression, you can look at where it was expressed. Family, it belongs to this family, this is the PFAM family, PFAM 00042, and other family databases. Uh, yeah, mm. and disclaimer and position in the chromosome, etc. etc. Et so, all this information is in one entry for one gene. And as I said, there are for, for the cis part, there are at least get close to one million entries for that. And in the in the tremble, there are uh, more than uh, uh, well. 10, no, 20 or 30 million entries. Okay, let's go for a break. Pause.